Syracuse, Georgetown, two former Big East foes separated by 370 miles. But ask either fan base, and they'll tell you the opposing program is always living in their head. And while it's not the 1980s anymore, where these two were constantly at each other's throats, the flame has never died. Now, the 99th meeting between the Orange and the Hoyas, and things look a little different. A new chapter of the rivalry, new coaches on each bench, and maybe some new fuel to ignite this rivalry once again. It's Q's Countdown, and it starts right now. Welcome into the Citrus TV studio. It's Q's Countdown time. Caleb Nice. Peter Elliott, and Liam Griffin. If that didn't give you goosebumps, I'm sorry. I can't help you. One of college basketball's greatest rivalries, Syracuse and Georgetown, getting ready to go to battle in the capital. And look, guys, it's no secret. I said it in there. It's not the 1980s anymore where we got to enjoy the prime years of the Syracuse-Georgetown rivalry. And the coaches who helped brew this feud are now gone. Patrick Ewing fired from Georgetown. And, of course, we know James Beheim. He's gone as well. So new faces in charge. Peter where does this rivalry stand now? Yeah, Caleb, as electric as that uh, pre-open was, and as much as I want to now say maybe it, it is uh, still vital, I think this rivalry has jumped the shark, Liam. I really think it has. It is not as vital as it once was. It's cute, but it's no longer that deadly clash that it used to be in Big East play. Even the players, Liam, they don't really know it as a rivalry. They were in middle school when Syracuse left the Big East. So this yeah. rivalry doesn't really mean anything to these players. Adrian Autry was telling the media that it means more to him and his coaching staff than it does the players. They've had to tell the players what it means. So really, when the players don't even know what they're playing for in this rivalry, can it be a rivalry? Uh, I think the players actually do know what they're playing for, Peter. And I have a quote to back it up. Justin Taylor said after the Cornell game, we watched the old videos. It's very special. We want to go down there and win. And also, Peter, Syracuse has no true ACC rival. Yeah, Pitt and BC. Cool. It's not Syracuse Georgetown. It will never be what it was in the Big East. Don't get it wrong. This is still a rivalry. People still care. All right, guys, before we get too ahead of ourselves, let's take a step back at Syracuse's most recent game, an 81-70 win over fellow New York State foe Cornell. It was a little close for comfort at times, LG, but the Orange squeezed it out for their 43rd straight win against the Big Red. Yeah, this was a good win against the Cornell team that is probably going to win the Ivy League, but yeah. it's not a great win. Still a ton of unanswered questions, Peter. There was a, there was a span where there were 5,032 seconds. I mean, come on. Cornell also shot 9 of 17 from the free throw line and took 33 threes. That didn't kill SU. If an ACC team takes that many threes, you're in trouble. Good win. Still a long way to go. Yeah, Liam, that game was downright scary at times. Remember that dunk from Isaiah Gray to cut the lead to three? Oh, I that remember. poster that was crazy. over Kyle Cuff, which, yeah, all the Sports Center viewers saw that on the top 10 plays that night. But uh, I really am impressed by how well Cornell played and Syracuse pulled away at the end. Uh, but I, I think one thing that stands out here is the depth. We thought going into the season that Syracuse would have a lot of depth. They only played eight guys. Cornell played 13. For Syracuse, one of those guys we didn't see, Liam, Benny Williams. We still don't know what's going on with him. So we've seen him play sometimes. We haven't seen him play uh, as of late, certainly against Cornell. We don't know what his future is, but that's one thing that stood out to me in this Cornell game, not seeing Benny Williams. One guy who did help Syracuse eke out that win against Cornell, Judah Mintz. Check out what Coach Autry had to say about a sophomore guard after the game. When Judah went out, obviously he's a key to what we do. We kind of got out of sorts, and JJ wasn't, you know, playing particularly well, finishing around the, around the basket. So when he made his drives, but he has to stay aggressive. We need him to be aggressive. So one thing that has become clear over the past few games is this team needs Judah Mintz. We saw the sophomore yeah. score a career high 33 points in a great win against LSU. The next game, one of the worst games of his career, just five points against UVA, a terrible loss for Syracuse. Now against Cornell, Judah gets in foul trouble in the second half, Peter, and SU goes five for 15 from the field. So what is this group without mints? Yeah, I mean, he is the straw that stirs the drink for the Orange. <laughs> I mean, really, the, he's not, the, this Orange team is nothing without him, but it's been a roller coaster ride of a season. You <laughs> mentioned, Caleb, a career high and then almost a career low against uh, UVA. So when he's not clicking, though, no one else is. And of course, when Reese Beekman shut him down, there was no one else to step up. We saw JJ Sterling play better, but he had just about the quietest 16 points you'll ever see in a game. So uh, when Judah Mintz isn't clicking, there aren't enough second options around 
around him to elevate when he's not on the floor. He's also got to stay out of foul trouble, Ian. Yeah, Peter, I'll talk about foul trouble first. He went out with four fouls with about 10 minutes to go in the second half. SU really struggled when he was out. And it's interesting you bring up the point of a second option because the second option this season for Judah Mintz has fluctuated. One night it's Chris Bell, one night it's Justin Taylor. Yeah. One night it's, I don't know, Nagi McLeod to name, <laughs> to name a yep. random guy. But Judah has to be the constant. But he's fluctuating too. So unless a tertiary option steps up out of the blue, you're in trouble if Judah Mintz doesn't play well. They're going to have a really hard time beating good teams if you don't have Judah Mintz playing well, Caleb. All right, guys. If I were to tell you after the Cornell game that Syracuse had nine blocks, I think a lot of people would assume that seven foot four Nahim McLeod had a hand in that. But the center had zero blocks and just four rebounds. The tallest player on Cornell was six foot ten. Liam, it seems that Autry's squad is really struggling to find an answer for anyone who can play the five spot right now. Yeah, Caleb, I'm just going to be honest. The center stink. <laughs> they cannot do much right now. Look, anytime you tell a center to step outside of the paint, oh, you're in big trouble. Naeem McLeod and Malik Brown, two good players, especially on the defensive end, they cannot stretch the floor. And more on Malik Brown. He's too small to play the center against yep. the best of the best in the ACC. I'm looking down the line here, Caleb. When you get to Kyle Filipowski, PJ Hall, and Armando Baycott in yeah. the ACC, and you don't have a good center option to go up against them, you're done for. Done for. Liam, it really makes you miss Jesse Edwards. I, you mi I miss the Dutchman. He's, <laughs> by the way, West Virginia's second leading scorer, so he's clearly found greener pastures in Morgantown. But you look at a guy like Naheem McLeod and Malik Brown who can't play both ends of the floor like Jesse Edwards could. He was really an offensive threat. And then defensively, he was a real stalwart there. Neither can really play. And then with Naheem McLeod, you're only at best getting 20 minutes out of him. And again, you look at a guy, like Caleb said, who's seven foot four, but statistically, he's not putting up seven foot four numbers. The second tallest player in Division One, not playing like it with the way uh, he hasn't swatted the ball away, hasn't rebounded the ball. They need more out of their towering giant. Exactly. Now let's rewind even further past Cornell to UVA last week in the game. I'm sure the Orange would like to forget in a 22 point loss. SU had 14 turnovers in the ACC opener. After the game, J.J. Starling said the team was going to move on, learn from their mistakes, and just get better. Peter, J.J. is right. The Cavaliers had 18 points off turnovers, and this is an area that could haunt the Qs all season if they don't figure it out. And it already has, Caleb. I mean, you saw 14 turnovers against Virginia, 12 against Cornell on Tuesday. You can't keep giving up possessions like that and then expect to lose, especially, like we always say, as they head into ACC play. Syracuse leaves the power six in turnovers. That's not good with 107. And, of course, we know SU likes to play fast in transition, but it's been doing so, so sloppily. J.J. Starling, Judah Mintz, have not been handling the ball well. A combined 40 turnovers between the two. But, you know, Liam, it goes both ways. Syracuse, they're also causing turnovers. That's one good sign here. Yeah, this is not a good ball handling team, Peter. And it's admittedly, rely or admittedly dangerous with an offense that's so reliant on Adrian spacing, like, or on spacing, like Adrian Autry likes to preach when you're making such quick passes. It's dangerous, but this is not a good ball handling team, Peter. The Orange have 10 plus turnovers in every game except Colgate when they came back on a wing and a prayer. Yeah. This is an issue that has to be resolved right now because the good teams in the ACC are going to make you pay for it. And if you don't believe me, look no further than the game in Charlottesville. Yeah. All right, it's time for our first break here on Q's Countdown. When we come back, we introduce Yuz to the Hoyas. Don't go anywhere. CC back after this. Just one minute, okay? Hey, Bobo, do trees tell each other stories? I'm sorry, I'm afraid I don't know that. Hey, why don't we go find out? Listen. Do clouds take naps? I couldn't tell you. Birds draw pictures? I don't have an answer for that. Dad, do stars visit their friends? Look!
Welcome back to Q's Countdown. Peter Elliott, Liam Griffin, and Caleb Nice with you. Going into Saturday's matchup with Syracuse, Georgetown might have a bitter taste in its mouth. This past weekend, the Hoyas faced off with TCU, and the Horn Frogs led most of the game at one point up 15. It was a game that had everyone on their toes for TCU. They actually had their toes on the line because Liam <laughs> Frogs hit a game winner that after further review, Emmanuel Miller was out of bounds. But the refs couldn't overturn it just a heartbreaking way to lose a game. Uh, yeah, Caleb, the refs should be ashamed of themselves. That was as clear as out of bounds as it can be. But if you put that to the side, Peter, this was actually a pretty good effort for the Hoyas. Georgetown was, is in the 200s in the NCAA's net rankings. TCU's in the top 40. Yeah. No one expected that game to be that close. Yeah, you can be angry, but it's still a great effort. I think the spirit of the Hypno Toad must have been with TCU <laughs> that game because there was no reason the Horn Frogs should have won that game. What a circus shot from Emmanuel Miller. But beyond just this game, Liam, uh, looking beyond TCU, which was a good opponent, the Hoyas have not played well against inferior opponents. They played one of the easiest schedules so far this season, and it has not looked great. It lost to a 2-7 and seven Holy Cross team, one of the worst in Division One, and they had narrowly uh, beaten America in Jackson State and Merrimack. So beyond just this TCU game, which surely played okay against uh, the Horn Frogs, they haven't looked good against really weak opponents. That bodes well for Syracuse. Okay, so let's talk about the guy who's in charge there, Ed Cooley. His first year in DC after he was swept away from Big East rival Providence, and he's got quite the uphill battle. The Hoyas fell off the face of the earth last season, and what would end up being Patrick Ewing's final days at the helm? Georgetown finished a 7 and 25 overall and a measly 2 and 18 in conference play. Peter, it can't get much worse when you're taking over a new program. It like can't. That. LG is chomping at the bit right now to rip <laughs> into Ed Cooley. You, you'll get your chance in one second here, but you're absolutely right. That's so tough to inherit a program that went 2-19 and 19 to end the season. But I think Ed Cooley is the right choice to take over this program. He's honest. He's realistic. He's the kind of coach that the Hoyas really need. And, of course, they're paying him $6 million a year to do it. Uh, I think this year, honestly, will continue to be a struggle for Georgetown. I think they will win a lot of conference, uh, lose rather a lot of conference games, probably this one uh, up against. Syracuse, but I think this program is on the up and up. They're recruiting well, and I think Ed Cooley is the right man to be the bench boss of this uh, this Georgetown team. LG, rip into him. Yeah, he deserves all the flack he's getting for going from a Big East school, Providence, to another Big East school in Georgetown. You just don't do that. But, Peter, you mentioned recruiting. He flipped the 2023 floor star Drew Fielder from Providence to Georgetown, as well as the 2024 four star. The Ed Cooley effect is starting to take its place in Washington, D.C., he may be a traitor, Peter, <laughs> but he's a very mild-mannered guy, and it's starting to pay off. All right, well, let's you cool down now, LG. You have a new coach coming in, but with that roster from last season, got a total facelift. Georgetown has 11 names on the roster. You had a lot of guys transfer out of the program, but a lot of new guys come in from the portal. Guys like Jaden Epps and Don Tristiles, who have done well so far. Liam, do you think everyone had to wear those stickers that said, hello, my name is, <laughs> the first couple weeks? I would imagine so, Caleb. 11 new transfers. I mean, you're only bringing four players back from last year, just two of whom saw regular minutes. And the guy you mentioned, Jaden Epps, he's seen Syracuse before. In the ACC Big Ten Challenge, when SU and Illinois matched up last yes. year, he had 11 points. He's yeah. averaging 19 per game, second in the Big East. Their second leading scorer is a UNC transfer. Their leading rebounder comes from Fairfield. This is a very new LaCoya squad. Yeah, they might still be wearing those name tags, guys. <laughs> I mean, it's pretty remarkable how fresh-faced this whole team is, but this is a team that is so emblematic of our current era in college athletics, entirely built through the transfer portal. They lost it all after last season, and they rebuilt it entirely with guys from other programs. So, I mean, it'll be a real test to see how well this strategy can work, not really relying on any high school recruits, but entirely taking guys from other programs. They have limited experience playing together. We'll see how that plays out over the course of the season. And while it is a whole new roster, chemistry hasn't really seemed like an issue offensively. These guys have been shooting the rock from deep. And they've been doing it well. The Hoyas are shooting a whopping 39% from beyond the arc. Peter, that's second best in the Big East and 25th best in D1. Yeah, I mean, this is a Syracuse team that has not defended the three yeah. very well so far this season, especially on the road. Syracuse uh, is giving up 43%. Uh, opponents, rather, are hitting 43% of their shots beyond the arc, the 12th highest rate in the nation on the road. So Syracuse uh, has to go into this game in Washington, D.C. and really defend the perimeter. It'll be interesting to see how Adrian Autry balances playing zone and man, we know it's kind of been a, a balance between the two. It's not just that Jim Beheim team that only plays zone. So we'll see here, and that especially depends on who is out there at center, Malik Brown or Nakeem McLeod. We'll see how they can defend the perimeter in this game, LG. Yeah, not only does Georgetown shoot the three ball well, they also shoot it at a very high volume. They won't hesitate to let it fly with a defender right in your face, but you see it on that graphic there. Two guys who shoot well over 40% from beyond the arc. 
Georgetown down with 6 of 25 from 3 against SU last year. That won't be the case this year. SU will have to defend the perimeter well against the Hoyas. It's time for another break here on CC, but don't go anywhere. You've got a game coming up, cap or no cap. We'll be putting on some headwear and talking more hoops. Q's Countdown back after the break. other stories? I'm sorry. I'm afraid I don't know that. Hey, why don't we go find out? Listen. Can birds draw pictures? I don't have an answer for that. Dad, do stars visit their friends? Look! Welcome back into the Citrus TV studios. Q's Countdown rolls on with Peter Elliott and Liam Griffin. I'm Caleb Nice. So we've got some new headwear on. We're playing a game. It's cap or no cap. I'll give a statement about Syracuse basketball. If it's a lie, it's cap. If it's not a lie, you say no cap. All right? So our first statement here, Chris Bell second on the team in points per game with 14. But sometimes numbers don't tell the full story. So Peter... Is Bell the second best option on this team? No cap to that, Caleb. Oh. Do I, I think I, do I yeah, take it off? Take it off. I, I take it off. So no cap. No, I love the Syracuse flap room here, courtesy of our guy Dan here. Uh, I think Chris Bell absolutely is Syracuse's best second option here because really there's no other option for this SU team. J.J. Starling, I think, has proven to be a little too inconsistent so far, though I'd love to see him build on that game he had against the Hoos uh, last Saturday. Justin Taylor as well. He hasn't really found his, his shot consistently enough. I think Chris Bell, also, again, another guy who's been a little inconsistent Consistent. He'll have a great game, and then he'll uh, go over. But I think he will level out and become Syracuse's true go-to guy as the second option by you to miss Yeah, the hat, the cap's coming off for me too because it. it's no cap for me as well. And we talk about Chris Bell and the being the second option when he is hot. He is hot. And Peter, you mentioned it. The the other options have been too inconsistent. Whether it be Justin Taylor, Benny Williams for a game or two, yeah. JJ Starling can't shoot the jump shot consistently. Right now, right here, right now. Chris Bell is the best number two option, and that's no cap. We agree. I'm not going to take off the hat because it's keeping me warm, but I also agree <laughs> Chris Bell is the you, second best You look best very option. festive, too, Caleb. Thanks, guys. Stay Nick over here. Our second question, or our second statement, might be a sore spot for some Q's fans. Longtime guard here, Joe Girard, now with ACC opponent Clemson. He's been doing really well. He's had the highest three-point percentage for the Tigers. He had 25 points against Pitt, 23 against Boise State. Now, Liam, Syracuse at times seems to be lacking scores. Do the Orange have a hole in their heart right now the size of JG3? Oh, uh, well, I'm going to grab this again because oh, it ain't wow. just cap. It's wicked cap. Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're pulling out the Boston accent. And we look, who wouldn't miss taking contested long twos five seconds into the shot clock or all that defensive ineptitude? He's a player that needs the ball in his hands to succeed. It took away from Bell, Taylor, and Judah Mintz last year. He's a good player when he's hot. When he's not hot, he's as good as unplayable. I'm glad you really talked that out, Liam. It was a real therapy session to get over your, uh, your, your qualms with JG3. I think this team really does miss JG3. Oh, so this cap is staying right here on the shelf. Well, you look at how well he's been playing in another orange uniform just down in the Palmetto State with Clemson. That team is 8-0 and he is shooting the lights out uh, for, for Clemson. Again, I really think this team could use a second option. This is the answer to that previous question. Imagine Joe Girard as the second option behind Judah Mintz. He could pick up the slack when Judah's in foul trouble or not playing well and when J.J. Starling is inconsistent. I think J Syracuse really misses his perimeter shooting and also sometimes his energy. 
Oh, pish posh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, Liam. I'm going to agree with Peter. I think they really need that scorer, and Joe Girard yeah. would be a great option. Our third and final statement, Syracuse right now 0-1 in ACC play, but will the Qs finish in the top eight of the ACC standings? There's 15 teams in the conference, Peter. Right now, SU is in that mid-lower range of those standings. Where do we see the orange finishing? As much as this cap looks pretty great, how about the script font here? Yeah, I gotta no. throw this cap away. No cap here. I think the orange do finish in the top eight here because you look at the bottom half of this ACC and it doesn't look very good. Let's be honest here. The Syracuse team is nowhere near competitive with the upper echelon of the Atlantic Coastal Conference. They got pantsed by Virginia. <laughs> I don't think they fare very well against Duke or UNC, but I think they're significantly better than the bottom feeders. You talk about teams like Wake Forest and Pitt and Notre Dame and Louisville. This is a Syracuse team that is better. And I think the line on this, Vegas would probably have that line at right around eight, finishing eight for Syracuse in the ACC. I think they get above it. I think they will level out throughout the season and uh, win enough conference games to finish in that top eight in the conference. Peter, let's let's talk about those bottom feeders that you mentioned. Yeah. Here's, here's how the things go in the ACC. You got Georgia Tech, Louisville, and Notre Dame at the bottom, and then right there after them, you got Syracuse. It's cap. Is this team really going to finish in the top eight of the ACC? Yeah. Come on. The ACC is way too loaded. Duke, Carolina, Miami, Virginia, Clemson, NC State, Pitt, Virginia Tech, Wake, Florida State. Really, really good. And and Peter, it, I like it when analytics back my back up my argument. They do. 11th in the ACC in Ken Palm's adjusted efficiency. 12th among ACC teams in the NCAA net rankings. Until this team, for goodness sake, decides to play a little more consistently, it's cap, and I might need that cap that Peter tossed out back. Using <laughs> analytics, you sound like you go to Duke, LG. Oh, that's a low blow. <laughs> but if you can't tell by the hat, I'm a glass of milk, half full kind of guy. I think Syracuse finish, finishes in the top eight of those ACC standings. But one last break here on CC. When we come back, we take a stroll through the history of this rivalry and give our final predictions. Don't go anywhere. Q's Countdown back after this. Welcome back into the Citrus TV studio. Wrapping up Q's Countdown, Peter Elliott, Liam Griffin, and Caleb Nice previewing everything you need to know for Syracuse and Georgetown. So one of the premier rivalries in college basketball, guys. Two former Big East teams going at it, now in their 99th meeting. We're so lucky to see these two hit the floor, but really lucky to see so many great other rivalries just in general in sports and life. So what are some of your other favorite rivalries? They all flood back. There's so many over the years, so many we've gotten to witness, so many we've seen on YouTube, I think, over the years that we yeah. weren't old enough to even witness. For me, uh, I think we'll touch on a couple here, but I think for me, Tyus Battles shot in the 2019, uh, to the game winner in that 2019 game uh, at, at home. But also, uh, I mean, I, I think CJ Fair's dunk over Otto Porter in the Big East, Big East tournament. LG, you've got some, some favorites? Oh, of course I do. But I mean, on the topic of favorite rivalries, Caleb, Red Sox, Yankees, uh, now even more lopsided now that Juan Soto is playing for the bad guys. All right, well, we're not talking baseball. We're talking Syracuse, Georgetown. So now I think we got to take a stroll through memory lane and talk about some of our favorite Syracuse and Georgetown rivalries. If we're going to talk about the Syracuse-Georgetown rivalry, we have to go back to where it all began. One of my favorite moments between the Orange and the Hoyas. The first matchup between the programs dates all the way back to 1930, a game SU won 40-18. to 50 years later, in 1980, everything would change. For nearly two decades, the Syracuse Orangemen had been playing their games in Manly Fieldhouse, but the time had come to find a new home, the Carrier Dome. The Cuse had won 57 straight games at Manly at that time. They were ranked second in the nation, and in its last game in Manly Fieldhouse, 
SU led Georgetown by 15 with just 14 minutes to play. The Hoyas stormed back, and Eric Sleepy Floyd hit two clutch free throws with five seconds left to lift Georgetown over Syracuse, stunning everyone in the building. But what made the rivalry become what we know it as today are the six words Georgetown head coach John Thompson said after the game. Manly Fieldhouse is officially closed. Manly Fieldhouse was closed for business. Manly Fieldhouse is officially closed. Manly Fieldhouse is officially closed. A line so iconic that if you type Manly Fieldhouse into Google, it will prompt you to finish the search with, is officially closed. The rest is history. What transpired was one of sports greatest rivalries. Peter, can it get any better than that? Yeah, Caleb, believe it or not, it does get better. Let's go from Manly Fieldhouse to Madison Square Garden for our next iconic chapter of this rivalry. On March 10th, 2006, the two teams squared off in the semifinals of the Big East Tournament, but few thought Syracuse would ever get to that point. After jetting out to a 15-2 start, the second half of SU season went south. Jim Beheim's squad went 7-9 in conference play, including a 15-point blowout loss at the hands of the Hoyas in February. That made Syracuse's deep run in the conference tournament all the more miraculous. After eking out wins over Cincinnati and one seed UConn, the Qs were on a collision course with the hated Hoyas. Just like in the regular season, Syracuse came out sluggish and trailed by 15 at halftime, but it clawed back. Down by just one point with under 20 seconds to go, Jerry McNamara, whose magic had taken the Qs that far, took the ball up and found his backcourt make Eric Devendorf, who laid it in to put SU up one, 58-57. The first lead of the game for Syracuse. Jerry, how does that feel? Floor slapping good. Coach Beheim, would you have beaten jo Georgetown without Jerry McNamara? Without Jerry McNamara, we wouldn't have won 10 f***ing games this year. Okay? Not 10. And everybody's talking to me and writing about Jerry McNamara being overrated. It's the most thing I've seen in 30 years. And Coach, without the physical nature of the game, we wouldn't have a bleeping Syracuse-Georgetown rivalry, right? It's no secret the Orange and Hoyas don't like each other at all. And that's evident in the tenacity and physicality they play with on the court. Even though things haven't been quite the same since SU left the Big East, it's still there. Look no further than three years ago on a January night when the Orange and Hoyas met inside the Dome. No fans, by the way. And look at this. Marek Dolzhai, number 21, stumbles to the ground. Great push-up for him getting back up, though. But he sprints right to the bench. Here's why. Gets absolutely clocked in the mouth. And you're about to see this little special thing. Look at that. He lost his tooth on the floor. That's Syracuse Georgetown physicality for you right there. If there ever was such a thing, take a look at it again. Look at that push-up for him. He was in a very big hurry to get back to the bench. And there's that precious smile that's now famous to SU fans. And after the incident, Jim Beheim couldn't help but think of the rivalry's glory days. It was just an accidental play. In the old days, it might have been on purpose, but it was, <laughs> this was accidental. So we hit on some great key points from the rivalry there. Up on your screen, those are some other key moments from this rivalry, guys. Take a look at that. Yeah, I get goosebumps every time watching that CJ Fair dunk because it was the final Big East game. That ESPN doc record win for the Big East really makes you feel something. So, so good. And I think Tyus Battle, one of the most clutch players in Orange history, he proved it once again with that game-winning jumper over the Hoyas to beat them inside the Dome. Well, before we say goodbye, we have to give our predictions. Liam, who gets the W and bragging rights until these two meet again? I hate to be Debbie Downer. No, I'm kidding. Syracuse is winning this one 77 to 72. Look, SU is just the more talented team. The Orange I've been, are, too, are, too more, are too talented and too good for the Hoyas to handle. It'll be a closer game because it's on the road and it's a rivalry, but I think Justin Taylor goes off close to his hometown. Ditto. Absolutely everything LG said. I think the Orange take this one 78-66. to 66. Again, the Syracuse team is just too good. I think they're going to stay hot from their game against Cornell. The biggest key here is just hitting shots from the perimeter. They went 40% from beyond the arc against Cornell. Keep that pace. Don't shoot 25% from perimeter like they did against Virginia. So I think as long as they hit their shots from deep, they will beat the Hoyas and take this 99th matchup. Yeah, I like that Justin Taylor point of going to the DMV. He's from Charlottesville, and he had a chance to go down there the other week and face UVA. We've got two oranges, 
I'm going to make it an orange out here Ooh. on Q's Countdown. I have Syracuse taking this one 75-68. to 68. I think they win that 99th meeting, get the ball rolling, and a good start to the Autry era. But that's going to do it for Q's Countdown. Syracuse and Georgetown coming up on Saturday. A huge thanks to our 2023 producing crew, Liam Griffin, Peter Elliott. I'm Caleb Nice saying so long, and thanks for tuning in.